Hello. This week marks World Press Freedom Day, and I've got the pleasure of having Dave Lindorf's company today. Dave is a, an internationally respected journalist, author, and filmmaker. Dave, welcome. Thanks for having me, Finian. Hmm. David, we're going to talk about this fantastic film you've got out at the minute. It's doing the theatres around the world. It's a documentary film with the title A Compassionate Spy. And you've also got a book out accompanying that uh, of the title A Spy for No Country. Now, the film and the book deal with the life of Ted Hall, who was the youngest physicist working on the Manhattan Project 1943, 44, 45, in the creation of the atomic bomb in Los Alamos uh, Laboratories in New Mexico. And Ted Hall, as a scientist, felt a crisis of conscience and, out of principle, divulged the secrets of the atomic weapon to the Soviet Union, which then went on to develop its own bomb in 1949. And as Ted Hall had calculated, this would prevent the United States from having a monopoly on this new lethal weapon, which it, it was to use in Japan to devastating uh, effect in 1945. So, David, without further ado, I'm going to ask you to give us a, a little summary of Ted Hall's life as a physicist and what he did. Nuclear weapons were new. He saw that the U.S. was going to come out of the war with nuclear weapons. He saw how they were willing to use them against two defenseless cities at a time they didn't need to be used. And he saw. He also heard that they were talking about the Soviet Union being the target after the war. And what he had imagined was, uh, and, and he had great misgivings about what he had done because of uh, the vast cost of the arms race that ensued. What he thought was going to happen was that if the Soviet Union got the bomb, you know, before the U.S. had enough bombs to uh, attack it with you know, devastating power, was that uh, when they realized both countries had the bomb, it was a pointless weapon, right? I mean, uh, it was like, I think what he probably had in his mind was what happened to poison gas after World War I. Everybody saw, you know, both sides were using it. Uh, the devastation of that weapon was so clear that they ended up banning the gas uh, and, you know, the, the, in its various forms, nerve gas, mustard gas, and all this stuff, and a pretty effective ban, actually, criminalizing its use. And he thought that that would, is what they would probably do if they both, if two powerful countries that uh, were not allies at the point that, that we're talking about had the bomb. Uh, in the interest of humanity, they both would realize and and ban the bomb. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, the opposite happened, and they ended up in this uh, you know crazy arms race uh, where the, um, having more meant you were better off. And, and and of course it didn't. But what it did have the effect of doing anyway was that we've had 77 years with no further use of a nuclear bomb in wartime, but not uh, a guarantee, you know? I mean, there were some pretty damn close calls mm -hmm. and, and Ted was aware of that. But in the end, each time, whether it was someone at a low level, like a captain of a submarine in the Cuban Missile Crisis, or a someone at NORAD who was supposed to report that there was a missile on the way to the U.S., but decided, no, nah, it's probably not a missile. I'm not going to report that, uh, you know, and then it turned out to be a meteor or something. Um, so, you know, some at a low level or at the top level, you know, where someone like Eisenhower uh, was contemplating using nuclear weapons uh, it, when things were bad in Korea and, um and some one admiral came in and said, well, you know, uh, it's possible we, we could use it, but it's also possible that the Russians would get one bomb through and hit the, the one harbor where all our 
Navy vessels are in South Korea, and that would be uh, make uh, child's play out of Pearl Harbor. And Eisenhower said, okay, okay, so we're not going to use the bomb. So, dear, so it, it wasn't so much that Ted Hall was a Soviet sympathizer or sympathizer of the communist ideology. Is that what you're saying? He was motivated by trying to, in his best calculation, uh, strike a blow for for peace, world security. There were two. There were two key spies who allowed the from from all the research I did that allowed the Soviet Union to get a bomb by 1949. And one was Klaus Fuchs, <clears throat> and the other was Ted Hall. They both had the same kind of information about the plutonium bomb, but the Soviets were very skeptical about Klaus Fuchs for two reasons. One was that he was German, and uh, the other was that he they knew he was a communist in Germany, that he had fled to England, and somehow, despite the fact that the British knew that he was a communist, he had moved to the top of the nuclear uh, secret nuclear program in Britain. And in the um, U.S., he was like right up there as the key person who was making this happen and uh, and was actually put in charge of the uh, British uh, atomic bomb project after the war at um, at um, what's it called? Uh, Her- <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. Um, starts with an H. I'm sorry that the, it right outside Oxford. And, and associated with the Oxford Physics Department. Um, and so, um, you know, how could that have happened unless he had turned? So, you know, Beria and, you know, these other people were fairly paranoid about uh, Stalin, uh, paranoid about U.S. intentions and British intentions. They looked at that and were saying, how the hell did, did uh, you know, Klaus Fuchs get to this high power uh, position unless... He know, knowing he was a communist, unless he uh, had turned. So they were doubting this crazy Baroque uh, plan for the plutonium bomb that he was saying and thinking it might be disinformation. And then in and then he had disappeared from their radar for six months. They had no contact with him, and um, they didn't know where he was. And then there's Ted Hall walks in the door. Uh, of the the uh, of a spy's office in Manhattan and offers the same information that mm-hmm. that they were already getting from Klaus Fuchs plus more in more detail about the implosion system that he was working on and that gave them the confidence and gave Stalin the confidence to say okay you can have all the resources you need and we'll make the plutonium bomb. Even and, though, even though Dave, I mean, Ted Hall at that time was was a real young guy. I mean, he was twenty years old, working on the not other. even twenty, not even twenty. He so, was he, that, he was that, eighteen when he was hired in January nineteen forty four, and he was eighteen when he was put in charge of one part of the uh, work on the plutonium implosion system, and he was nineteen. Uh, when he gave the plans, the actual plans to the bomb to the Soviet Union. So, you know, we were talking about a kid. Mm. And we have to remember, um, Dave, that at that time, I mean, there was a lot of sinister elements, figures in the U.S. establishment, the military establishment, like General Leslie uh, Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project. Didn't he articulate to people informally that the the real objective was to bomb the Soviet Union with this new weapon. I mean, there was a a danger that that the United States government could be overtaken by fascist uh, militarist figures. And I think Ted Hall was aware of that that possible danger. He was very aware of that danger. I mean, and and in fact, it it came close to happening in the McCarthy uh, HUAC period in the United States. Fascism was really on the rise when when um, in the in the forties or or at the end of the war, actually, let's say to nineteen. This was in September, I think, nineteen forty four. The British mission to the Manhattan Project, which was basically all the British atomic scientists who had been working on the bomb for Britain, 
um, up to that time were shifted over to uh, in in uh, early 44 were shifted over to the Manhattan Project to try to get it going faster and um, really top people. That's when Fuchs was sent over and uh, wrote Blot and all these guys. And um, so they had a party at uh, for for the Manhattan Project. I'm not. I can't. I can't remember whether it was the British mission that hosted the party, or if, I think that was what it was. But Groves was invited to this dinner, and um, they, uh, you know, they had the dinner and at dessert, they were all talking about the future uh, ahead because it was clear by September that Germany in 44, that Germany was losing the war and was not going to get the bomb. And some people like Joseph Rotblat were saying, we shouldn't even build the bomb at this point, you know, and others were saying uh, like, like Leo Szilard and Niels Bohr were saying, we should bring the Russians into the project because they're, why are we doing this in secret from Russia? They're our main ally fighting the Nazis. So we should bring them into it, not keep it secret from them. And Leslie Gore said at the dinner, well, you know, of course, that the real target for the bomb is the Soviet Union after the war. Mm -hmm. And that was a shocker for people. And Rotblat quit. He was, he was the only one who did this. He quit the Manhattan Project in November of that year to have nothing to do with it because he decided it was criminal uh, to do what they were doing and would lead to disaster. So um, that's kind of the environment Ted was in when he was deciding whether to become a spy, which he did in October. Mm -hmm. So he, the, he wasn't at that dinner, but you know that when that came out, that that spread around the camp because there was a the thing that Oppenheimer had set up at uh, Los Alamos was a very unique situation. The camp was on the top, seven thousand feet up on a on a uh, plateau, a mesa, and, and it was fenced in, a fenced in compound guarded by MPs, military police, and uh, the, nobody was allowed to talk about the what they were doing outside that fence. But Oppenheimer insisted that within the fence, there would be complete freedom of speech and people could talk because it was the only way to run a big high speed science project was to have everybody free to talk and, and communicate. So clearly, people at that dinner were talking in shock about what Grove said, and that had never been expressed before. And so Ted clearly knew that that was happening. And that was very disturbing to him. So um, I would say that Ted was a sympathizer of, of socialism in the Soviet Union. He was a sympathizer with the revolution. He was not a communist at that point. He did briefly join the party in uh, after the war in 47, uh, because they saw it, he and his wife saw it as the only organization that was opposing uh, the uh, uh, apartheid system in the U.S. of blacks and that was supporting unions on, on, uh, without any reservation. So, um, Do you, but, but, mm, and Ted went on later, uh, you know, spent the, the rest, the later part of his life living in Cambridge in England. Um, I mean, was he, persecuted or, you know, prosecuted by the U.S. authorities. I mean, after all, he had just given away, you know, the biggest secret of the century, the 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 keys to making a, an atomic bomb to the Soviet Union. Uh, how, how come he wasn't, you know, hounded? By it's, a, it's a fascinating US story. And uh, this part of the story is only hinted at in the movie because we didn't have the details yet. Um but Ted thought there was some possibility that it was his brother, his brother's position as a, a, a brilliant rocket scientist uh, developing ICBMs for the uh, for the U.S. Ironically, and not a spy, and not even a leftist, but um, his older brother, eleven years older, uh, his name was Ed Hall. Um, he had that position. Uh, as a, and he was in the Air Force. Um, and so he was so important to the missile program. He, he actually designed the Minuteman missile. 
and uh, and also rescued the Atlas program, which was the first U.S. intercontinental ballistic missile. It was a failure, and he changed the whole engine uh, approach, and then and made it more powerful, and and cr- made that a possible missile that could strike Soviet Union. So it's pretty weird to think of that brother, right? And but um, what uh, Ted suspected was that maybe his brother's position kept the him from being arrested because you can imagine in the McCarthy period if uh if McCarthy was accused saying that the military the Pentagon was infested with communists and and, mm-hmm. and if Ted had been uh, ch- openly charged with spying his brother would have been toast in terms of his role uh in the missile program nobody that would have been a banner headline you know r- America's top rocket scientist uh, brother of uh, a communist uh, atomic spy, right? I mean, it just couldn't happen. So, and and in fact, I got Ed, uh, Ed's uh, FBI file. No one had ever applied for it. I got it. And what I discovered, the fir- when I first started looking through it, I found a letter uh, addressed to Hoover from uh, on January 6th of 1951, where he, uh, oh, it's from Hoover. I'm sorry. It's a letter from uh, Hoover to um, Joseph Carroll, uh, who was this general who was in charge of the Office of Special Investigations for the Air Force, saying, uh, dear dear, uh, Joseph, and because it had been a former aide of his, and he, you know, knew him really well. Um, I'm writing to inform you that a uh, major hall in the Air Force is uh, working on a top secret missile engine project at uh, Wright Patterson Air Base in Ohio, and is a known a known at- Los a- Los Alamos atomic spy. Uh, mm-hmm. And we would like to question Ed about him mm-hmm. uh, and his knowledge of him. Mm-hmm. And so the, then there, I don't have the responses from uh, General Carroll, but what I do have is a second letter in March, March uh, six, March 18th of that same year. And it's a, a more of a pissy letter, not a friendly letter to General Carroll. It says, Dear General Carroll, um, uh, in uh, I received your letter of January eight of March. I'm sorry, I'm, of January 18th. Um, in response to my January 6th letter, in which you say that you will be handling your office will be handling the investigation into uh, Ed Hall's loyalty, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> uh, we have just questioned Ted Hall. And our investigation in, into his case is advancing, and we would like to urgently interview Ed Hall. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, he didn't get to interview him until June twelfth. Think about that. From March eighteenth to June twelfth, he didn't get to talk to Ed Hall. Urgently didn't happen. And um, what happened was he was told. He could his that the FBI could interview Ed Hall, but they could not ask him about anything about himself. They could only ask him what he knew about his brother. And Ed Hall stonewalled them completely. Mm-hmm. And, and what we also know is, and this is in the movie, but we didn't know the importance of it at the time, was that um Ed Hall was interviewed by the OSI early like in january and february four Mm -hmm. times by investigators from the osi of the air force and they concluded that he was uh, totally trustworthy Mm. meanwhile he knew that his brother was marked as a spy right Mm -hmm. so when so he um made a trip from ohio to where ted was living in chicago Mm -hmm and showed up unannounced the very day uh, after Ted and his roommate and spy courier, Savvy Sachs, had been grilled for two and a half hours by the FBI. 
right? The next morning, Ed showed up on their door, right? Uh, ironically, the, he showed up right after a telephone repairman, in quotes, had left their apartment. He had come unannounced also and said he was there to repair their phone. And uh, and they hadn't called for a repair. So, you know, they let him in and he took their, you know, old rotary dial phone apart and you know, messed with it and then told them it was okay now, right? And they all, they, you know, Joan and Ted knew that there was a tap being put into it. And um, because he had just been grilled the day before. So he left. And shortly after that, Ed comes up to the door and knocks on it. And, you know, that Joan said she came to the door and there was Ed. It was like, well, oh, Ed, what's, what's going on? He had driven there because he didn't trust the phone. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so he, so, um, he had them come outside because he knew the house was bugged. And then he said, so, so Ted, what kind of trouble have you gotten yourself into here? And then they, Joan said they walked off for an hour talking together on the street. Mm-hmm. You can imagine what they were talking about. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, after that, he got, he did get questioned. I had, the report on the questioning of him, and it was limited to him. Mm-hmm. And one of the questions they asked him was, when was the, la- this is June 12th, when was the last time you saw your brother? And he said, well, you know, I used to be very close to my brother, but then with the war, I was sent to England where I was repairing bombers. And um, I didn't see much of him except on a couple of family dinners after the war. Uh, and the last time I saw him was a year ago. Mm-hmm. Now, that was a complete lie because he had just visited his house, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so he he risked a lot there, <laughs> and it's amazing that he didn't get caught. But um, but there's a funny incident uh, in the in his file uh, in the in Ted Hall's file, which is that on the next day, uh, on the day that that happened. Uh, after the investigation, there's a report from an FBI um, agent who was stationed with another one to monitor Ted and Savvy Sachs on a 24-hour basis. And he said that he had to stop what he was doing because he was uh, carjacked or attempted carjacking by uh, two uh, colored men, as he put it, uh, one who opened his door while he was sitting in his his car, watching the the uh, the, the hall residents or Sachs residents, and put a gun in his side, right to take the car, and and he said he pushed the gun away, and then um, and then the, his car radio went on. And hit, and the guy ran away because he realized, oh my God, this is a cop car because it was obviously an undercover car. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, and then they they ran off trying to chase him. They weren't armed, and so they called off the the observation and went back to get armed up and probably body armor because they didn't know that what they were doing was going to be physically risky. So that day they missed. They, they weren't doing any watching. So that was a total uh, mm-hmm. stroke of luck for Ed because he would have walked in th- up the door and they would have said, oh, my God, there he is, right? Uh, he managed to relocate to England, you know, um, without any problems. You know, he got out of the United States without any hassle or, you know, um, aggravation from the authorities. He was able to relocate. Well, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Fidian. The, the, the record shows the the FBI record shows that after uh, after the questioning of Ed by the FBI, um, the Air Force s- several weeks later promoted him to colonel from major. Right. In other words, that was a huge thumb in 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 Hoover's eye because he had just done his investigation of Ed and. They say they promoted him, so they were saying, you know, he's fine. You can't and and somewhere in the files, which I can't get, um, is 
inevitably some communication to the FBI from the Air Force saying you can't arrest him. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything to Ted or Sachs because, you know, we need this scientist in our missile program. Mm -hmm. And so that was the end. And, and in fact, they stopped. There's letters. I do have the file that at, in the fall of 1951, it said we're closing the uh, special security index. Uh, we're removing Sachs and Hall from the special securities index, which is the one that says you need to monitor them all the time and know what they're doing. So they pulled them off of that. They were no longer subjected to mail covers, phone taps, uh, mon daily monitoring of their, their whereabouts. It was stopped. Mm -hmm. So the investigation stopped really in, before 1952. And it did not pick up again until 1965, at, which was after Ed had left the Air Force and retired. And so that's more evidence that the FBI was called off of this because of Ed. Mm -hmm. Once Ed was gone and no longer of concern to the Air Force or the missile program, they they picked it up again. And the way they picked it up was twofold. Ed had, Ted had been able to go to England. He had gotten a job in Cambridge as a uh, biophysicist. Mm -hmm. And then um, he... Um, in 1965, three years later, um, when he wanted to renew his passport, uh, suddenly he was uh, he he waited and waited and waited or his visa rather, uh, he waited and waited for his work visa and it didn't come. And then when he called about it, they said uh, you need to come into the office. When he came in, he was uh, he met a guy from MI5, the British equivalent of the FBI. And they told him, look, Ted, we know what you did. We know all about it. So why don't you just come clean? We're not the FBI. You know, we're not going to arrest you and put you in jail, but we want to know uh, from you what you did. And so, and, and Joan says in the film, you know, That's when Ted came back, right? Joan, he, his wife. Yeah, jo Joan Hall, who's still alive and living in, in Newnham, outside Cambridge. You, you interviewed her, uh, you know, personally uh, to, to obtain a lot of this inside information on his biography. She's a main character in the film. And, 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 and also I can get to how I got onto the film from meeting her. Mm. So, but the, but the main point on that is that, that uh, she told him, she saved his life a couple of times. And this was one of them. She said, Ted was really anxious to get, it off his chest because he'd been living, he hated living this secret for 50 years and he wanted to talk about it. And that offer that they made to him was attractive. What he didn't know was it was the FBI that put them up to it. And, and, uh, they, their agent, uh, uh, in their liaison agent in, uh, London at the time, uh, a guy named Cram, uh, told the, the first people who wrote, who interviewed them uh, and wrote a book called Bombshell back in 1997, um, where they uh, interviewed him and he said the FBI called MI5 and said, try to get him to talk. So that's what that was. And Ted came home to Joan and he said, you know, I'm really tempted to just get it done and tell him. And Joan said, I think they were walking along Grantchester Street towards their house. And Joan said, I turned to him and I said, you'll do no such thing. You'll stick to your story and uh, and that's it. No talking. And he said, you think? And she said, yes, I do think. And she said, "They'll their, their promises don't mean anything. They'll arrest you. They'll destroy our lives. They'll destroy your daughter's lives. You can't talk to them. And he didn't, yeah. luckily. Dave, unfortunately, we are running out of time. The minutes are ticking by here. As so many questions I've got to ask, and I'm sure viewers would, would have their own questions, lots of them. Um, how's the film doing, Dave? It's it's, round, it's going around the various countries in theatres. What's the, the feedback so far? What's the reception been it's like? It's getting great reviews. It, it opened in England uh, last month at a theater in London, 
and for public view, not part of a festival. And it got a, a, a rave review in The Guardian. I, I think you must have, you saw that review. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was a rave review. And most of the reviews have been really like, you know, four or five star reviews. Mm. It sounds, you know, it could make a great blockbuster feature film, you know, with a, a lead man and uh, various, you know, prominent actors. I mean, the, the actual story is, is such a gripping story and full of, um, you know, twists and turns and twists of fate. Um, you, you've done a documentary on, on you know, interviewing Ted's uh, widow, Joan, but um, the, the, the subject could be treated as, as a docu, you know, as a film, a feature film. It would make a great film. It's a, it's a it's a great love story. It's a great spy story. And uh, Participant Films, which funded this documentary film uh, directed by Steve James, um, is uh, has the option for the uh, for a drama. So, as a question, somebody somebody will want to option this. I think, especially if the Oppenheimer film does well, which is a drama. Mm. Good luck with that, Dave. I mean, I wish you loads more success with the sub, the, the whole subject. Um, let's just close, Dave, with um, returning to World Press Freedom Day this week, and perhaps we could reflect on your this fantastic subject of Ted Hall's life and what he did. Um, I mean, by the way, quick quick question: you you would contend, Dave, that uh, Ted's actions were a, a vital contribution to maintaining world peace in that oh my god yeah because you know the us nobody knows this and it's in it's in the film for the first time that that right after the war the us started the research on the hydrogen bomb and they also uh began industrializing production of the atomic bomb even though they thought that the russians wouldn't get the bomb for 10 years they started mass producing atomic bombs it wasn't easy to do but mm. uh fortunately it didn't happen fast but by uh august 29th when the russians blew off their copy of the nagasaki bomb uh the the U.S. had 220 atomic bombs the size of the Nagasaki bomb. And the only reason they didn't bomb Russia then with those 250 bombs was that the Pentagon had told Truman they would need 400 bombs to securely destroy Russia as an industrial power. And uh, and they also didn't have enough bombers to carry even the 250 bombs they were having to restart the B-29 uh, um, assembly line and get better bombers because the B-29 wouldn't be able to make it to central Russia where a lot of their uh, atomic industry was and back, mm -hmm. you know, safely. So there was a delay and they weren't going to be able to do it till 1950 or 54. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time that they got the 400 bombs, the Russians had blown up their bomb and they were industrializing bomb production too. So it never happened. So really Ted saved the world from a, I think a, a clearly a Holocaust of uh, unbelievable proportions if the US had done that to Russia. Yeah, a compassionate spy documentary film produced by Dave Lindorf, accompanying book, um, A Spy for New Country, we should mention that again. Yeah, that comes out in November. Yeah.